When we ended things last time, the Vault Dweller had managed to rescue Dr. Hornwright from her captors and had restored the Motherlode Drill. With all the elements in place, it was finally time to start the heist of the Gold Reserve within Vault 79. I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is Part 8 of the story of the Settlers of Foundation. Upon returning to the basement of Freddy Fear's House of Scares, the Vault Dweller was happy to see all parties were present. Paige, Jin, Sergeant Radcliffe, Penelope Hornwright, and even the Motherlode were in place. The drill made its presence known with a gaping tunnel entrance in the rear wall of the basement, and the roar of its efforts echoing from the distance. The party followed the mother load in and found that the newly dug tunnel was filled with subterranean creatures, from mole miners to cave crickets, curious at the disruption. The tunnel passed from rock and stone into an old train tunnel packed with mole miners before returning to the soil beyond. Finally, the human heist crew members caught up with a mother load at the reinforced concrete wall of the vault. Mother Lode had calculated that it would not survive tunneling through the vault's protective shell, and expressed some trepidation at the prospect of death. As little as they wanted to, the Vault Dweller convinced the drill to continue on its path. Within seconds, the Mother Lode passed into the vault, and the party was confronted with terrible quantities of laser fire from the myriad turrets and robots inside. After successfully ridding the room of these defenders, the settlers had their beachhead in the vault. The next challenge fell upon Jin as they approached one of the vault's laser grids. Jin paused for a moment to ensure her mother's stealth armor was up to the challenge. If it failed when she was passing through the grids, she would be cut to pieces. After talking to Radcliffe and steadying her nerves, she cloaked and passed safely through to the other side. Having succeeded in her task, Jin's next objective was to open the way for the rest of the team. As she attempted to utilize a security terminal to turn the grid off, she touched off an alarm. Security robots poured in to reignite the fight for the beachhead. After a harrowing fight with these bots, Jin disarmed the laser grids, and the party could move forward once more. Before they proceeded deeper in, Dr. Hornwright decided it was time for her to exit the vault. Her part of the heist was completed with the breaching of the vault. Beyond this, she wasn't much of a combatant, and her lab coat was poor protection against waves of hostile robots. Thus, she departed for Foundation, leaving the reduced party to press on to the so-called Hall of Death. Where the laser grid had been Jin's problem, it was now Sergeant Radcliffe's time to shine. Using the turret hacking tool obtained from Robco, the sergeant managed to deactivate the numerous security turrets in the hall. Unfortunately, when he subsequently opened the door to the Hall of Death, the mounted guns reactivated and began to fire upon the settler party. While the heist crew took cover, Sergeant Radcliffe hacked into the grid, hoping to short out the electrical systems. As he worked frantically, security robots joined their stationary colleagues in attempting to push the invaders back out of the vault. Despite his claim of shorting out the turrets, Radcliffe actually managed to turn the turrets on the robots, and the powerful guns made quick work of their former allies. With the way cleared, the party pushed on to the atrium, where they once again encountered hostile security turrets that were on a different circuit than those that had come before. Once they were taken care of, the Vault Dweller and their companions pushed into the atrium beyond. Here, they faced waves of security robots that culminated with a fight against a massive sentry bot. With another security barrier cleared, the party found themselves facing a sealed door. Radcliffe made his way to the Overseer's office, hoping to open a way forward. Though he succeeded and the passage opened, a party of feral ghouls poured into the atrium. After taking care of these unfortunate fellows, the Vault Dweller and the Settlers moved on to the hallway from which the ghouls had come. They followed it to another door that, when opened, revealed a man in a black suit with black glasses standing behind a security station window. He had the appearance of a government agent, which was fitting as he, like all other dwellers of this vault, was a member of the Secret Service. The agent of the window, nicknamed Slick, was soon joined at the window by another agent, AC, who explained the situation at hand. Before the bombs, back when the gold had been transferred to the vault, the agents had been stationed there to protect the gold until the government came to claim it. For nearly 26 years, they had kept their duty and maintained the gold repository. Three months prior to the heist, the agents had been performing maintenance on the reactor when it malfunctioned. Half of the population had been killed or converted into ghouls. Power levels were low, which kept the remaining agents sealed in a small section of the vault, and they were running out of food and water. Though the agents remained loyal to their mission and would never normally consider letting the gold out of the vault for anyone other than the United States government, AC recognized how perilous their situation was, and thus he made a deal with the party. The Secret Service would grant the settlers access to the gold if they restored power to the reactor. 
This was a deal of practicality if nothing else, as the gold was inaccessible without power. Together, the Vault Dweller, Jin, and Sergeant Radcliffe made their way to the reactor. At its entrance, they found another man in a black suit and sunglasses, but in this case, he was also a ghoul. Despite this, he wasn't hostile. Agent Chase, or Digger as he was known, had become a sentient ghoul. He explained the situation. The reactor was stable, but offline, and so long as the ambient radiation in the chamber remained as high as it was, there was no getting it back online. Along with this, the reactor was swarming with feral ghouls that were once Digger's co-workers. Digger had considered venting the chamber to clear the radiation himself, but he feared that any additional dosage could turn him feral. The Vault Dweller, wearing their Chinese stealth armor, luckily a radiation-resistant outfit, made their way to the control room, fighting when they couldn't sneak past the ghouls and Wendigos. Once in the control room, they activated the emergency ventilation, cleansing the room of radiation. With the radiation cleared, the reactors came back online and the security system rebooted. The ghouls were gone quickly. The Vault Dweller then destroyed the turrets and made their way to the gold processing room. Here they found 1,000 gold ingots, and somehow the party of three managed to pack up and carry that gold out. They made their way back to Digger, with whom they returned to AC. At the checkpoint, the agents nearly fired at Digger until the Vault Dweller explained the nature of ghouls to AC. The agents had been locked underground since the war, and the malfunctioning of the reactor had created the first ghouls they had ever come into contact with. The Vault Dweller vouched for Digger, securing a place for him with his old companions. With that, the conversation turned to the gold carried by the Vault Dweller, Jen, and Sergeant Radcliffe. The Secret Service still wanted the gold, but they weren't going to try to take it from the party by force. They offered a trade. Gold for advanced military schematics. They wanted to enact the original plan for the vault, establishing a new currency for the United States, rebuilding the economy, and with it, the country. Regardless of the desires of the vault dweller, it wasn't just their gold to trade. A lot of it, half at least, belonged to the settlers. AC told the vault dweller that if they changed their minds, they could come see the agents and provided them with a key for easier access to the safe section of the vault. With that, they all walked to the Gold Vault Operations Center and discovered that what they had found in the transfer room was a drop in the ocean of the real supply. It was here that Paige finally joined the Vault Dweller's party. The Vault Dweller kept half of the gold, handed the settlers half the remaining gold, and left the last quarter to be collected by the Raiders of the Crater, as agreed to with Hijack. Though Paige was disappointed at the reduction in the size of their cut of the reward, he accepted the 250 bars of gold for foundation. The Vault Dweller celebrated their success with their companions. Jin was happily moving her mother, the one-time Chinese agent Mochu, into Foundation. Cognizant of the potential that her mother's former handlers might come for the suit, she had the plan of putting the stealth suit on a corpse and putting it to the torch. For his part, Sergeant Radcliffe was happy to say that the old guard would be sticking around Foundation, where they would oversee the settlement's security from then on. After concluding things with the party, the Vault Dweller took some time to gaze in wonder at the majesty of the view. Over the next few months, Appalachia entered a short-lived period of peace. In this time, Ward assigned Samuel the job of dealing with a gold trade that began because of the events at Vault 79. Once a vault dweller from an unnamed vault, Samuel had arrived in Foundation shortly after its founding, and since that time had worked odd jobs for Ward. The vault dwellers spent a good deal of time with their former heist members and helped the locals on a few missions of their own. On a seemingly daily basis, some piece of tech or another would be stolen from Foundation, and the Vault Dweller would help Ward to recover it. The first sign that the relative peace in the aftermath of the Vault Raid wasn't to last came with a nearly indiscernible message crackling over the radio. It was soon revealed to be the voice of Paladin Leila Romani, head of the Brotherhood of Steel, First Expeditionary Force. Alright, that should do it for this episode. When we come back for episode 9, we'll get into the interactions between the newly arrived Brotherhood of Steel chapter and the Settlers of Foundation. A special thank you to my patrons and channel members, and thanks to all who came by to watch this video. This has been the Resolute Cartographer, I'll see you again next time.